Hey everybody, Coach here. Hey, welcome to this week's video. Hey, we're moving off into the third chapter of our little summer landscape series that we're doing. This one involves the small hillside and boulder retainer in it, and I hope you enjoy it. It's, uh, it's kind of a down and dirty little lesson on how simplistic they really can be, provided that you have the tools and materials on site to do the job right. Okay, so in this case, we got JD there to do some of the heavy lifting. I've already had 10 cubic yards of loamy soil delivered, which is piled up there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the video. And this part right here, hey, we're just, we're just uh, stacking them up and shimming them up and bracing them up so that when I pull, pull and place the soil down next to the, the boulders, everything is secure. It'll be secure now, it'll be secure when everything is frozen, and it'll be secured throughout, hopefully, the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. It's not going to go anywhere. So these particular boulders are leftovers from the original purchase of the boulder triangle in the backyard. Um, we only purchased 40 um, that we tagged at the quarry. And when the truck got there, there was a heck of a lot more than 40. And so we had a lot left over. And the driveway was all choked full of these boulders for a couple, three weeks. And so we said, we'll just take them and use them in the hillside over there, which we were going to do, but we thought they would have to be a separate purchase. But in this case, there were some smaller ones that were able to be manhandled. And then there were some larger ones like this one that obviously needed JD to be able to pick it up and bridle it up and, and move it over there. But it was kind of fun. And this particular initial setting of these boulders was during the evening uh, that we, we had after an early dinner. We just got out there and after some of the, the hot sun took care of the, the heat just a little bit, we were able to do uh, not quite half, but close. And then we, we waited until the next morning to finish it off. In total, probably about an hour and a half or so, maybe a little bit more, maybe a couple hours to set these. And the thing was, is it kept getting longer and longer because I still had plenty of rock. Um, as I tore apart the remainder of that pile, what I thought was gonna be like a dozen or so kept growing. So just kept using them. This particular one I really liked. I, I specifically excavated out to get it because I think in hillside planting, it's really a good idea to have some kind of a central access point. And that's what this boulder provided. It had a very uh, square shape and very flat top on it, which made it just a great step rock and is actually one of the lowest points in this whole uh, boulder line and you can see it there now one of the things I had to do and I I did it when the soil was dumped is I had to put a tarp down across the French drain that I'm kneeling on right here I had to have that French drain protected until we started placing boulders so when you see me scooping dirt out before the placement of each rock I'm clearing that soil back away from that French drain so I don't get any infiltration down in there with fine, uh, recently roared, fluffed up soil. And it'll just ruin some of the French drain capabilities. So in this case, hey, you can see it. Now, so this is the end of the, the first evening. And we were expecting about a half inch of rain or more. And it was wet when we got out there the next morning. I had to pull the tarps off and there was a lot of water that came off those tarps. So I was really glad I did that because I hate working in mud. I really do. And that soft loamy soil would have been a, just a quagmire to have to play around in, shovel in, plant in or whatever. So tarping that off, you can still see that it's dry. There was a little bit of wet up at the top uh, where the, na the native hillside still is. But for the most part, all the infill, all that brand new soil was perfectly workable. And I was very happy we, we took that extra time. So being the next morning here, we're all fresh and it hasn't hit its he heat yet, thank God. And we were able to 
stack up the rest of these in line right behind that French drain. And I want to explain to you something that I did not do here. I did not put a drain behind the wall. What do you mean, coach? Isn't that your, isn't that your mantra? Isn't that your, your tell-all, teach-all? Yes, in certain circumstances. Yes, for sure. But this one is not very tall at all. And this gaps and spaces between the boulders, because they're not nestled in there watertight by any means, there's sometimes inches uh, in between each boulder. So it makes it easy for water to just come right out from underneath them and then go into the French drain. So in answer to your question, stacked block walls, uh, large, large walls that uh, do not have a lot of water uh, filtration capabilities at the base of it, absolutely. Put the perf pipe back there, gravel behind it, especially if you're much taller than what this little thing is. This is only 18, 20, 24, maybe up to 28 inches tall at the most. And with all those slots there, there was no problem. I, I was perfectly confident that there was not going to be any hydraulic pressure uh, large enough that would push these boulders over or cause any sort of a, a landslide type of situation. Most of these boulders average between, um, oh, I'd say 180 to 400 pounds. That was the average. And when you're placing these things and you want to keep them, keep them vertical and just slightly tilted into the hillside, Use some of the kibbles and bits that are around. Use some of the, uh, the little broken pieces like I did. And you can shim them up behind, you can shim them in front, and you can get them to the really kind of rock solid just sitting there. And then pull some of your dirt down to the base of it and just make sure that it's just slightly tilted into the hill and not tilted away from the hill. Hey, you can see we've kind of put a dent in that pile out there. There was still quite a few left over, even at the end of this boulder line, which I took and I put over on the other side of the house in just kind of a ring the hillside fashion. And we'll use them for whatever we use them for as time goes on. And it's a nice, neat way to display them for now. But this boulder line turned out to be probably about 37 feet long or so. And it used like 16 or 18 uh, individual boulders to accomplish that. So now that they're all they're all set in place, they're all shimmed up, they're kind of backfilled down at the base of it, it's time to take that soil and pull it down from the upper reaches of the hill and start to tamp it down into the cracks and crevices and really start to firm it up. This particular time we had these plants on site. They were ones that were left over from the garage sale. Uh, a few clearances that were still remaining. There were some Veronica. Uh, the little, the white pots there were tall white flocks. And this is what it looked like when we got it ready and prepped and tarped for that overnight rain. So most of the tarp, the green ones, was, which is covers a lot of my firewood. And then the old black one was left here by the previous owner. So... It was worth the extra 15 minutes to do that. It really was. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be doing this a day later. So there's the rest of the plants that we had to go in. And there's a total of about 37 of them here. 37 in a 37 foot long by 12 to 14 foot wide bed. Most of them are just small herbaceous perennials. We have some Coreopsis, the dwarf Coreopsis. We have some sun moon hosta, some dwarf flocks that are uh, in there. And a lot of the stuff that I got on this planting day was uh, all clearance. Still, I, I'm a big proponent now of checking the clearance rack when I get to the box stores, the box store nursery, first place I go. And if I see salvageable plants that I know may not have their glory on in the nursery any longer they they're out of bloom or they got damaged a little bit man i just 
I just zero in on those like, I don't know what, ants to honey, I guess, ants to sugar. I, it's just a great way, a great fiscally responsible way to give plants a home, save a few bucks, and know what to do with them when you get them back to the planting site. And it, it sure does work well. And it has really, really shown. And the plants are kind of grateful for it, believe it or not, because, heck, everything we've put in the ground that I got there and I deadheaded, gave it some food, gave it some water, a uh, little haircut here and there, everything that we've put in has started to return return the, the, the thankfulness and the bloom and the growth. And from my perspective, as a landscaper and a horticulturist, uh, that, you, you can't ask for more. You can't ask for more for a $4 plant. You really can't. So again, when you're doing your planting here, we got a 50-50 mix out of the hole. We're putting in that uh, planting amendment and I am not putting in any fertilizer at this point because those buckets you see down on the driveway down there, those were my half strength dunk buckets that I did the night before. And those were where they got watered, fed, deadheaded and taken care of. So I know that the plants that are going in right now, they're well watered, well fed. And the only time that I'm gonna need to water at the end of this planting phase is just to settle the plants out. I do not plant dry plants. And one of the things you have to remember, this is, this is really dog days of July. And we're having, I'm planting right now, probably at about six o'clock in the evening, and it's still almost 90 degrees. And for us, that's a freaking heat wave. That's like 110 out on the West Coast. And there's humidity that goes along with that. So I knew these plants had to get in the ground and be well taken care of. The other thing that I was up against is we were expecting rain overnight again. And if this ground had all these plants scattered around on it, and then it came in and get a quarter inch of rain, I'd have these little muddy rivulets running down the hill and into the French drain, uh-uh. So, we had an early dinner and we just made a pack that we were going to go out and get messed up and we were going to get hot and sweaty, no doubt. And you'll see as I go along, these jeans that I have on, I'm getting wet knees, I'm getting wet thighs. Uh, the sweat is just pouring off of me because it is so humid right now. Now, here's a little trick for you. If you're up against multiple plantings, um, and maybe this is not your forte, but you know you have to do it to improve your property or whatever. Don't look downstream as far as how many do I have left. Concentrate and perfect the art of getting the plant in the ground and doing everything you need to do just to that plant and then move on to another plant. Don't look to see how many you have left. It's, uh, it's like running a marathon. You know, you, you don't want to look at your, your timer watch every 30 seconds to how, how far am I now? You know, are we there yet, Dad? No, you're not. So just remember to the, the plant at the moment is the most important plant in that whole project. And you have to make sure that you do it right because the one in the middle of the planting plan and the one at the end requires the same perfection or you will not have the same results. Screw up once, it'll tell you. It'll tell you by wilting, dying, yellowing, uh, any way it can, any way it can to say, uh, yeah, you didn't put me in the ground right. So concentrate on perfection every single one, every single time. So as this planting goes along, and this was about uh, an hour, hour and a half, maybe hour and 20. That particular Veronica, yeah, it needed a little bit of a root trim. You think? That thing was so root bound. So I just took off the, took off the bottom root ball that was there and it will, it will take care of itself now that it uh, has a lot of food and a lot of new soil to expand into. So here we come. We're kind of coming up towards, towards the end. And I'll tell you what, 
uh, for the end of the day planting thing. This was uh, this tested my metal again, as it is tested every single time I've done one of these now. And there we go. There's the there's the N1. And Maestro, bless her heart, man, she was out there with me, and she was staging up the bark because with that rain that was supposed to come in that night, uh, I had to have I had to have this thing barked up and then I could sleep easy. I wasn't going to worry about any sort of a washout. The last little plants they had going in here is I had some uh, Asiatic uh, lilies that were left over from an area over by the front door and not in the right place or anything else. So we dug them up, put them in some sawdust and a paper bag last fall. And I'm hoping that they're still viable. If they're not, oh well, it's not, a, not the biggest loss. And then watering in here, watering in and not because the plant needs water, but because it needs to be settled out. And that planting hole in there needs to just implode just a little bit and get a lot of the air out of that, that new rich loamy soil so that the roots aren't uh, surrounded by a lot of air. You want to have it surrounded by moist dirt so that there's actually that ability for the roots to take up moisture. They can't take up moisture very well if nothing but air surrounds them. So make sure that you water them in every single time. So now I know we're kind of on the home stretch. I know that once this bark is in, I can go in, take a, take a nice shower and get cleaned up, watch a little something and be done. And I don't have to worry tonight whether that hillside is going to be destabilized. And it did rain. It, it rained that night. Not a lot, but enough to certainly water everything in again. And hey, it was good. It, would, it turned out nice. I went out the next morning. Everything was fine. Um, there was no, no harm, no foul. Now to let you know, this process bark here, uh, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence about it still. I'm used to a different kind of bark from out in the western part of the U.S. It was a much different type. Uh, this bag stuff, which is the only thing available where we live, uh, per se, unless you want to drive an hour and a half to, to get some other stuff, it, it works. Um, it's the darker, what they call black mulch, but honestly, already after a week's worth of being out there, it's already starting to fade, despite its claim to color guard the color for at least a year. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not buying that at this point. So you can take a look. All those plants that are there, all of them were uh, rescues, shall we say. <laughs> they were all discounted. The only ones that weren't discounted in that planting thing there was the purple gem rhododendrons. They were full price. So three out of 37, less than 10%. Well, that hillside planting in the dog days of summer was a little bit of a challenge, but it was fun as well. I'm so glad you took a couple minutes to join me here. Hey, if you have a chance, jump on over to the website, check out the book and the course, maybe a couple of the checklists. I really want to say a special thank you to my new friends down in Sherman, Texas, Norcross, Georgia, um, Newport, Washington, and Southern California that signed up for the, the online consultations to help them get their project underway and get a direction for them to go. I really appreciate you very, very much. And for all those who took a look at the book, got a couple of checklists, I appreciate you as well. Guys, that's what I have for you this week. As always, to your landscape success, I will catch you next week. Thanks for tuning in. Bye for now. <laughs>